Okay. So welcome everyone today to our Family Matters National Week of Action event, um, ensuring our babies get the safest start today on Friday the 14th of May. Um, my name is Jacinta Cracker and I'm a member of the Family Matters National Leadership Group and Chair of the Family Matters Policy and Research Working Group. I'm a Noongar woman living and working on Wurundjeri country in Nam, and I want to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people and their elders and to elders of all the countries across the continent that people are joining us from today. I'm a qualified social worker employed as a lecturer and researcher with the University of Melbourne's Department of Social Work. I'm currently undertaking my PhD with the department and my teaching and research expertise centres on child and family welfare with a particular focus on Indigenous peoples. My PhD research explores Indigenous peoples' understandings of cultural connection for Indigenous Australian children in out-of-home care in Victoria, Australia. Today, we're going to hear from expert practitioners and researchers in an area which has long been a cause of the greatest outrage and concern to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And that is the continuing removal of babies from their families with little or no support available either before or after these harrowing events. Today, we'll have the opportunity to learn from groundbreaking practice insights and research about the nature of this problem. And together we can start the discussion about how to prevent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies from being removed from their families and communities. It's great to be able to host this session today with an incredible lineup of speakers. Professor Megan Davis of UNSW, who led the independent review into Aboriginal children in out-of-home care in New South Wales and the subsequent Family is Culture report. Emma Buxton Namaznik, and Dr. Althea Gibson from the Family is Culture Research team. Alison Elliott, Clinical Family Therapist and Workforce Development Manager in the Indigenous team at La Trobe University's Bouvery Centre. Deborah Bennett, Executive Lead and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Engagement and Cultural Advisor with Relationships Australia Queensland. And La Trobe University Associate Professor Kath Chamberlain, Head of the Healing the Past, Nurturing the Future project. And today we're also joined by Catherine Little, SNAKE CEO. So just a few words regarding this online event. We are recording this event and it will be uploaded to the Family Matters and SNAKE YouTube channels later. We're also live streaming right now on the Family Matters Facebook page. So right now you can text all your friends and colleagues who didn't get to register beforehand and tell them to join us on the Family Matters Facebook um, to watch this. We do encourage you to keep your videos on during um, the event today. If you're on a computer or a laptop, you can set your screen to gallery view by clicking the button in the top right hand side. You can also add your name or your organization's name or your people by clicking um, on the three dots at the top right hand side of the screen. Um, sorry, and I've just... Uh, I've uh, gotten some word from Alex to say that Megan Davis is sick today and sorry that she's not um, presenting. So apologies for that. Um, just going back to talking about uh, your names on the Zoom webinar, we, can in, we encourage you to use your full names. And if you're representing an organization or community, please include that with your name. The chat function will also be on throughout this event. So you can message our tech support uh, person, Zareen, if you're having any issues getting settled in. And later I'll call for any questions from the audience. So please write your questions into the chat and I'll try to get to as many as we can. And finally, if you're on Twitter, please follow the Family Matters um, Twitter page and use the hashtag that we've been using throughout our whole week, hashtag our mobs matter. So all of us in the room here today are here because we want to see all Australian children grow up safe, happy and nurtured and knowing that their connections to family and culture are respected and prioritised in our broader society and in the services and schools that they will encounter as they grow up. So we'll be beginning today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Emma Buxton Namaznik from the Family is Culture Review Team. Emma is currently in the final stages of a Doctor of Philosophy in Criminology and Human Rights at the University of Oxford where her research examines the issue of state responses to intimate partner violence against First Nations women. Emma has extensive experience in qualitative and quantitative data analysis, 
and legal research and has applied these skills working in roles at the University of New South Wales and the New South Wales Domestic Violence Death Review Team and the Family is Culture Review as an independent research consultant. We'll also be hearing from Dr. Elthea Gibson, who will be speaking alongside Emma, who also worked on the Family is Culture Review as a senior legal researcher. And Althea holds a Doctor of Philosophy Law from the University of Technology, Sydney. After her admission as a legal practitioner in 2001, Althea worked as a solicitor for the New South Wales Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions and for Spark Helmore Lawyers. Later, before working on the Family of Co Family as Culture Review, Althea moved to the Australian Law Reform Commission, where she was involved in a number of national inquiries into federal laws and practices. So thank you, Althea and Emma, who will be presenting together. Passing over to you now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jacinta. Um, so Althea, are you okay to share the PowerPoint? Yes, I will. Great. So um, before we begin today, we'd like to acknowledge that we are presenting from Aboriginal land. Um, I'm on Gamera Eagle land and would like to pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that this is, was, and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, also apologies on behalf of Professor Davis for not being able to make it today. We seem to have some fairly nasty viruses going around our office at the moment. So um, as you can probably tell, I sound a little bit rough also, um, but she's very sorry that she couldn't make it today. And we will do our best to, to present um, around this amazing inquiry that we were both so lucky to be a part of. So the Family as Culture Independent Review of Aboriginal Children and Young People in Out-of-Home Care was announced in 2016 with a mandate to examine the reasons for the disproportionate and increasing number of Aboriginal children and young people in out-of-home care in New South Wales. And that review was announced as a consequence of the amazing advocacy um, that we continue to see around these issues. The review was also established to recommend strategies to reduce the number of Aboriginal children and young people entering out-of-home care increase restoration and permanency outcomes and improve connections to family, culture and community for Aboriginal children and young people in care. So the methodology for the review involved several key pieces of work. Firstly, it involved our very dedicated team of reviewers examining the case files of the 1,144 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people who are in out-of-home care in the period between 1 July 2015 and 31 June 2016. As a consequence of this review process, the review made 3,018 recommendations around what work the department should undertake with the children and young people whose individual cases we reviewed, including in some cases to recommend processes of restoration be commenced. In many cases to recommend that the department do more work around establishing and supporting children's cultural connections. And in other cases to recommend urgent action around children's foster care arrangements, well-being and welfare, as well as many other matters. It was rare that the review did not make recommendations to the department about the Aboriginal children and young people whose cases we reviewed through this um, review process. So our methodology for the review also involved public submissions process, as well as meetings, district forums, yarning circles, barbecues and other informal gatherings. And our methodology also involved in-depth review of various quantitative data sources including um, departmental administrative data, pathways of care, longitudinal study data, and seeding success data, which is combined longitudinal government data sets um, examining children over um, the age of birth to kindergarten for two, two cohorts of um, all the children in New South Wales. We also reviewed qualitative data, which we generated using a representative sample of 200 cases from our case file review. Although if you're from New South Wales, you will know that the department continually likes to reinforce that it has reduced the number of Aboriginal children entering out of home care. The reality is that the proportion of Aboriginal children in the out of home care 
system is increasing and accessible and available data as well as community control over data is an issue that we discuss in, at length in the report. So the work of the review was also supported by a dedicated Aboriginal reference group, which included members of Grandmothers Against Removals New South Wales, young ambas ambassadors with experience in out-of-home care, academics, sector experts, and the New South Wales Deputy Ombudsman. The report was released on the 25th of October, 2019, and made 125 systemic recommendations for reform. Although if you've read the report, you will know it's very expansive. Today, we're focusing on the issue of prenatal notifications and newborn removals, which was a considerable issue that we considered in the review. So to give an overview of prenatal notifications and newborn removals in New South Wales, so one third of the 4,540 prenatal reports in New South Wales that occurred between 2016 and 2017 related to Aboriginal children. That was a third. Seeding success data, which tracks two cohorts of children in New South Wales from birth to kindergarten, revealed that almost 10% of all Aboriginal children who were born in New South Wales in these cohorts had screened into the department with a prenatal report before they were born. National data also indicates that prenatal reporting is becoming increasingly common across Australia. However, there are considerable gaps in the data that's available and in our knowledge around prenatal reports and newborn removals. In New South Wales, we don't know when unborn children are being identified and by whom. We don't have reliable data around why unborn children are being reported as being at risk of significant harm. DCJ do not collect or report accurate data around what interventions are put in place for expectant parents and how effective these are in practice. And this is notwithstanding that this is clearly a considerable issue for the department and for Aboriginal families and communities. Our case data suggests that up to a quarter of the children in care in our cohort may have been assumed into care from hospital after they were born, but we were unable to get accurate information for our whole cohort as DCJ does not collect or report its data in this way. And as Althea will now discuss, through the case review process, it became very apparent that the circumstances around prenatal reports, working with pregnant women and the removal of babies shortly after birth were often highly unethical devastating and representative of missed opportunities to provide early intervention and support to vulnerable women and families. So Althea, did you want to move to the next slide? Sure, thanks Em. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to give a very quick overview of the prenatal reporting system in New South Wales. Um, uh, so just um, first, a prenatal report can be made about an unborn child by any person with reasonable grounds to suspect that the child may be at significant risk of significant harm after birth. But with unborn children, this is not a mandatory requirement to report a um, unborn child. However, it, the system in New South Wales is set up to generate the reports. So the New South Wales health policies advise staff to report children, uh, unborn children, um, because it's a good opportunity to intervene early with mothers and work with families um, to help ensure the safety of the child when it's born. Similarly, if somebody's not sure whether to report or not, and you go to the department's um, mandatory reporter guide, it will encourage a report about an unborn child. So even though these reports aren't mandatory, they are very common and the evidence we do have um, from a few uh, studies, one in the ACT, one in New South Wales, is that healthcare workers are the, uh, a huge source of prenatal reports, you know, around 30, 40% in those two uh, studies. Um, then what happens when the prenatal report goes to the department, um, and it's allocated to a caseworker. The caseworker can um, refer the close the case or refer the parents to uh, expectant parents to something like Brighter Futures. Or um, if there are these high risk indicators, they can issue a high risk birth alert. 
Um, and they're told to do that uh, by the safety and risk assessment manual that the department caseworkers use. Um, the high risk indicators, um, you can see on this slide here, um, as being things like if there is a history of abuse or neglect of siblings of the unborn child, or if um, a sibling of the unborn child has been removed, or substance abuse um, and unmanaged mental illness, um, and a, a range of other factors. So if those high risk indicators are present and the caseworker decides that the expectant parents are unable to be engaged with services or resistance, resistant to intervention or transient, they can issue a high risk birth alert, which is essentially a form that is sent to the uh, relevant healthcare providers. Um, and upon receiving that form, that essentially means the legislation works so that uh, after the baby is born, if there is a high risk birth alert, hospital staff have to make another risk of significant harm report at the time of the birth. So that's just kind of the New South Wales system. Um, and then when we were looking at how that system operated in practice, uh, we, we saw that newborn children can be removed from hospital um, in a planned or unplanned assumption of care. So a planned assumption is when uh, the department has predetermined that it's gonna remove the unborn child and when they're notified it's born, the department goes in for the removal. However, this does not mean that the parents are informed that the baby is gonna be removed, their baby will be removed. Um, and in some cases, for example, if the caseworker decides that the parent might be a flight risk, um, parents are not informed about the removal and uh, caseworkers just turn up at the hospital. Um, there is no guidance about when somebody is a flight risk. Um, and it was, some, it was a reason that was used in a lot of the files that we uh, looked at to, um, to justify not intervening, I mean, to not, um, to not informing parents. Um, and so in these, even in these planned removals, um, uh, hospital staff might not be aware of what's going to happen. Um, in an unplanned assumption of care, that's when the department gets the notification a baby has been born and turns up to do a safety and risk assessment and decides at that point in time to remove the baby. So there are these two kind of uh, processes uh, that can play out. Um, but when we looked at, as Em said, we were quite surprised by um, how significant the issue of newborn removals was on the data that we we had and in all the cases files that we removed uh, in all the case files that we reviewed of unborn uh, of prenatal reports and newborn removals we found serious deficiencies in the casework um, and I have a couple of examples on this slide um, so in, example, in, in one of the cases, um, the child was assumed into care at 4 a.m. in the hospital, even though facts had told the parents they would be supported to attend a rehabilitation program. Um, and in another case, there were nine prenatal reports about an expectant mother. Um, however, the caseworker was only assigned after the birth of the child um, and the child was assumed into care from the hospital despite the child's grandmother saying there were family members um, willing and able to care for the child. So that's just a couple of examples um, of some of the casework but and there are more in the uh, families culture report. Um, and in terms of the impact of newborn removals, um, I mean the, I've uh, we've obviously there's obviously huge trauma associated with the removal of a child. Um, it's been described that parents uh, can feel like they're kind of in this in-between space where their baby is gone, but their baby is not dead. And it's a very difficult um, and traumatic experience emotionally. Um, and this can, and obviously this leads can lead to long-standing and serious psychological um, trauma for expectant parenting for expectant parents who've had their baby removed. And then, 
In turn, um, that can lead to low functioning, which can lead to a cycle of removals for a particular parent. Uh, so, and that is also the, um, the cycle of removals is what we saw um, given the way the legislation works and the high risk uh, birth alerts work. So you saw that a high risk indicator was that a sibling had been removed. So as soon as you have one sibling removed, there will be a high risk birth alert um, for your next unborn baby. And similarly in New South Wales, we have a provision in our Care Act that says if a parent's previously had a child removed, um, then that's kind of, that's prima facie or, or initial proof that the child is in need of care and, protect, care and protection. And then it becomes up to the parents in court to show that the circumstances are different. So it's kind of a reversal of the onus of proof. Um, so, and, and then of course, we know that children, Aboriginal children in out of home care um, can experience harm and we have, a large discussion of that in our report about the types of harm. Um, and we recommended that the harm of removal be considered in court proceedings because there's often this assumption that, uh, you know, removal is, is going to mean a baby is safe and um, that's not always the case. Um, and so just, and in, in addition to um, a cycle of removals for an individual uh, parent, we can also have a kind of intergenerational effect here um, because uh, we do know that um, children who have been removed are more likely to have, uh, pe people who've been removed as children are more likely to have their children removed. So the issue of um, prenatal reporting and newborn removals is actually really significant in terms of it needs to be addressed as a matter of urgency to help reduce the number of Aboriginal children in out of home care. Um, this, uh, this, this is just a brief rundown of the primary issues of concern that we noted in our report. And um, the first one is that, that there was an outdated and inadequate prenatal policy. Uh, it did not, it, can, it contains no references to cultural approaches to pregnancy and birthing, to pregnancy outcomes for Aboriginal women, uh, to intergenerational trauma, or to the very particular health concerns of Aboriginal women and babies. Um, while, at, while we were writing the report, there was another prenatal policy being circulated by the department for comment. Um, and that was also inadequate in term, as it didn't address these issues that we identified. I can't see that that has progressed at this stage, that, that one that was being circulated when we were writing our report. And I think, um, well, I think the department might have gone back to the drawing board with the policy. Um, a big, a second big issue was insufficient engagement with expectant, expectant parents. Um, and that's what we saw in, in the review of our files. So there was either, um, you know, very brief contact with the parents and no um, sustained early intervention or just no contact um, with their parents. Um, there was also, there is also a lack of post removal support for mothers and fathers, <clears throat> um, which we identified as being really important to help break the cycle of removals and to increase the chances that removed babies can be restored. Um, parents really do need to not just be, um, not just be dumped after a newborn removal, they need support and assistance in getting their babies back. Um, and we also recommended that that provision I spoke about um, earlier, Section 106A of the CARE Act, be removed um, as being just unnecessary. It's un um, but also because the way it's used in practice, it's not supposed to. It's, a, it's an evidential provision, but in practice, we saw some cases where caseworkers were using it as a ground of removal, in essence, like, oh, another, another child has been removed, so um, we'll, remove, like, we'll move, remove the next newborn baby. So for those reasons, we recommended that that um, provision uh, go from the Act. Um, and do, do, am I, um, do you want to talk? Do you want me to talk? 
yeah, yeah. sure. So um, as I noted before, the review made 125 recommendations related to its terms of reference around improving systems and practices around Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. So recommendations of particular relevance to the issue of prenatal reports and newborn removals included the recommendation that the department collect and report data around assumption into care or removal of Aboriginal children at or shortly after birth. Um, the, I think the, the visibility of these issues and um, data is a, a big theme in the report because as we all know, no data, no problem. And, and it seems that the department often doesn't collect or report on information that's really relevant, I suppose, to being able to get a real bird's eye view into practice. Um, so we, we made a specific recommendation around that for um, prenatal reports and newborn removals. We also recommended that the department developed a new pre developed new prenatal reporting and newborn removal policy um, for Aboriginal children, which Alf here alluded to a little bit earlier, that the department publish and distribute case studies of good practice intervention um, with expectant Aboriginal parents. And this is around improving competency um, because as, as Althea mentioned, we did identify uh, there were almost no cases where there were examples of good practice um, in this space. We also recommended that the department expand the pregnancy family conferencing program and that the department significantly expand the number of specialized prenatal case workers. Um, we also recommended that the department develop trial and publicly report on a triage system for prenatal reports that ensures that the parents of the most frequently reported unborn babies are given priority access to early case work support and early intervention services. Uh, as Althea mentioned before, a deficiency in practice was that we identified that when children were removed, there was rarely, if ever, any supports extended to the family by the department. So we recommended that the department introduce post-removal support for Aboriginal parents and to have who have had a newborn or infant child removed from their care. And also we recommended the repeal of section 106A of 1A of the CARE Act, um, which Althea mentioned, creates a reverse onus of proof for parents to prove that the situation for subsequent babies is, is different than um, the previous child who was removed. So Althea is going to now discuss briefly the government and department's response to the report, including its response to um, recommendations around prenatal reports and newborn removals. <clears throat> Thanks, Em. So um, the Family is Culture Review um, uh, initially received a very brief response from the department. It was a 3.5 page response. Um, and I know if you've seen the report, um, and as Em mentioned, it was a very comprehensive report with a lot of recommendations. So uh, initially, there was very little detail in that response. Um, but in late 2020, uh, the department um, published, a, I think it's a update, mm, update on implementation of the recommendations or something like that and in, within that uh, document uh, the department has uh, accepted a lot of the FIC recommendations um, so it's indicated it will improve collection and reporting of data uh, about prenatal reports and newborn removals. Um, it's going to develop a new policy and practice guidelines for expectant parents with content specifically relating to Aboriginal parents. Um, so not an Aboriginal specific policy, but a, a policy with some uh, content relating to Aboriginal parents. Um, it is going to review the, pre the, I think there are three pregnancy family conferencing initiatives. Um, that are currently operating and are operating very successfully. Um, and there was a lot of good stakeholder feedback about these uh, conferencing um, programs. And so it's going to explore the benefits of expanding the program. Um, and it's, the department has indicated it's going to look into funding for post removal support for parents. Um, so I think that's going to be a completely new model of funding or um, 
the permanency support program family preservation package might be used to provide that um, that funding for the post removal support. Um, and in terms of our recommendation to remove the uh, section 106A of the Act, um, there's going to be a review of the CARE Act um, in its entirety um, in 2024. And so the report made a lot of recommendations for um, reform to that Act. So that's only going to commence in 2024. There were some recommendations that I don't know what uh, the, the department's approach is. You can see them on the uh, side of the screen. So, I mean, it looks promising, but this is all in the scoping or being explored stage at the moment. And I, I'm not aware of any actual changes based on our recommendations at this point in time. And um, thank you. Sorry, I will stop sharing the screen. Thank you so much, Emma and Althea, for those valuable insights um, into the groundbreaking review by Families Culture. Um, now we're going to hear from a range of uh, practitioner perspectives, uh, starting with clinical family therapist, Alison Elliott. Alison is of Wiradjuri descent and also has Celtic heritage. Alison grew up in Dara country around the Hawkesbury River in New South Wales, and so has strong connections to the land there as well. Alison works with La Trobe University's Bouverie Centre as the Workforce Development Manager of their Indigenous program and trains students in Bouverie's Graduate Certificate in Family Therapy. Alison has experience working with grieving individuals and works with people to restore some meaning and purpose to their losses through recreating old practices with contemporary rituals and ceremonies that are applicable to their individual process. She has particular interest in working with young children using play and other creative techniques. Thank you, Alison, for your valuable insights and over to you. Thanks, Jacinta. Um, I'm just gonna see if I can share this one slide. How do I make it share? Sorry, I have one slide. <laughs> Is that, that's it. Okay. Um, thanks, Jacinta. And thank you for that report kind of overview too, because I'm very interested in um, the data from my, when you're working on the ground to know what's going to be recommended to the government. So that's really good to hear that. Um, I just wanted to use this kind of metaphor because when I'm working with families and mothers and children, uh, story is the main kind of language that I use, that it's stories. I don't use reports or data. It's more like what's our story and, and where are we in this story? So that beautiful quote there, um, which is that we're all living storied lives. We're born into stories and sometimes stories are told about us um, as well as telling our own story. So I guess I just wanted to give you that background. Um, I have done some narrative actual training as well. So one of the things that when I read reports, I've been working with um, Aboriginal mothers in the prison settings around Australia as well as in the at a home care setting. So um, just reading reports, there's a dominant story that's always told. And when I actually then sit down with the women and the parents, I hear a different story. And it's not often written down and it's not often recorded as a very different narrative. And I guess for me, part of my questions is when I'm hearing these stories about families, they're written from that different character. So there's a story of blame often, there's a story of risk. I think Althea mentioned the flight risk, which straight away, if you were telling a story from the trauma response about a little animal, you would say they're ready to run and that's a pretty normal response rather than seeing it as, a, as something wrong. Um, 
so some of these stories, I was just um, listening to three beautiful warrior women recently. One was in the outer home care setting who had her child removed and the comment was made, if she wasn't in the outer home care sector herself, she would still have a baby with her. And that made me question that those level of care that's often around, which seem as extra supports, are the very things that are um, kind of a constraint to having a go and getting her own supports around her own trauma story because that's what is really coming out here. And the other two beautiful warriors, it was the same, um, exactly what you've been saying, Althea um, and Emma, around if you've already had children removed straight away, there's no chance with this next child to even say, what are we going to do differently? They're already sort of seen as that they're going to fail and they're not going to um, be able to keep their little ones. One of them was applied to have the child, uh, the baby, because she was pregnant in prison. Um, and again, it was other children had been removed, so the application wasn't accepted. So I guess for me, just listening to these stories, I'll often hear, and I wanted to refer to, to Annie Miriam Rose, the da Didi, um, that one little phrase that says this learning and listening should go both ways, to really start to hear the other story, the other side of the story, not the dominant story, because there are, and I know Deb and Kath um, will go into this a bit more with the trauma recovery, there are programs that are working there are good news stories, but we're so swamped in the other story that we also join it as one of the characters of feeling like we ha we can't help here. It's, there's there's too much. To me, I because I grew up near the river, I feel like you know you join in the river and you're also feeling like you can't help others or support others. And the collective story for me, the Heart of it is the two worldviews colliding back, way back, 250 years of one system trying to tell a different system how to raise the babies and how to be in the world and how to, what to believe. And I guess that is that collective story is still on replay. It's still being retold. And how do we retell it? How do we actually change it? rewrite it where these characters because we're all in that story it's not separate it's not them and us uh, those characters can play a different role so even the child protection I know some great child protection workers but it's the system that they're stuck in that they have to follow these certain pathways that are really rigid and to, to, to challenge that each of us what character am I in this story? So when I'm in with the women, I'm a listener. I'm a in that story, but I can also be you're joining that story. So I'm also hearing what can we do differently? And it's more the questions that I come back with, with each of them. Um, and I just wanted to read around the dominant stories. Just, I don't know how fast I've gone. I ramble on a bit. Um, so dominant stories are what we tell ourselves about us, what others tell about us. We believe them to be true. Others believe them to be true. And we act out of that truth and others react to our behaviour. We start to respond to what we think others expect of us and then we come to expect of us what others expect of us. So it's kind of feeling like that heaviness of the dominant story, that if we join it rather than change it, we're just replaying it. And listening carefully for the unique outcomes. One of the women that I was with, she talked about her own childhood trauma and then when her children were removed, how she acted out of rage. And we retold that story as, as a lion, a lion cub, and then the lioness protecting her little cubs. And she said, I've never heard it written that way. I've never heard it retold that way. And I guess for me, this is the power of story, of finding ways to retell it and challenging ourselves as to where we are in the story. 
in the story of blame and judgment and uh, risk and all those words that keep getting used over and over. Um, I guess I'll finish up. Um, I know it's probably faster than the 10 minutes, but I just wanted to sort of bring that in as a sort of on the ground. And I know Deb's got some great stories too, just of changing this story so that we can become part of that in that storytelling. Thanks, Jacinta. <laughs> I don't know how fast that was. I didn't time it. Thank you, Alison. No, that was absolutely perfect. Thank you for sharing your, your insights. Now we're going to hear from a community development expert practitioner perspective uh, from Deborah Bennett. Deborah is the executive team lead, community engagement and cultural advisor with Relationships Australia and Queensland. Deborah is a Guri woman, a direct descendant of the Kula Lee peoples of southwestern Queensland, and Waka Waka and Gubby Gubby peoples of South East Queensland. With 40 years of community development experience, Deborah has held a wide range of roles in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander arts, in the disability and education sectors, and in young people's and women's health services. In her role with Relationships Australia Queensland, Deborah leads the cultural capability development for engagement with First Nations peoples as clients, members of RAQ workforce and community partners. In her prior role, Deborah worked as Marketing Officer, Brisbane City Council Community Development and Black Business Hub, where she supported the development and promotion of First Nations enterprise. Deborah is a founding member and director of the National Foundation for Indigenous Recovery and Development. Thank you, Deborah, over to you. Thank you. Um, Firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge everyone who's made the time today to be here and be part of this really important and historic conversation. Um, I believe that by people willing to bring their hearts and minds um, and, and you know, their experiences to these sorts of things, we can bring about change. We can be part of the solution rather than the problem. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, I am a great grandmother um, and I have raised um, and helped raise uh, 23 children as well as my own two biological children. So that is because I am so conscious of the need to support families um, at whatever point they're at. Um, and quite often when families and particularly First Nations families um, find themselves in the midst of some kind of health or um, social crisis or whatever, they um, often the older children are the ones that struggle um, because a lot of focus is on keeping the younger ones um, safe and well. So it's often the older children that I've taken on board and led them through to adulthood. So uh, with the full support and connection with family. So I'm a strong believer in family and family connection and supporting families and developing a community of support. They, that's critical to the work that we have to do to support families. Um, I was raised that way. I was raised with my extended family and in extended family and my mother, um, saw that as just a natural process for us. So that concept of it takes a village to raise a child has always been in First Nations people's mindset, has always been in our spirit and the way we conduct ourselves. It has always been in our, our version of family law that preceded anything else that ever came here since colonisation. So having said that, the work that I've done throughout my life has been from observing the impact on families of structural and systemic racism, of the ignorance of the mainstream system and the predominant culture toward our people, towards First Nations peoples, and trying to understand where we need to unpack this and how we need to have conversations and dialogue around it. So. Fast forward going into working in um, primary schools and secondary schools and tertiary institutions where education around these things happen. 
um, it has been critical to the work that I've done along the side of that, either side of that. I've been involved in reference groups and boards and um, building women's groups and women's support services and being on kindergarten boards and you know all sorts of things that support family. Recognising that families are fragile, recognising that families' lives change with the impact of just living life. That's the standard for any family. Yet for First Nations families, it's been an extraordinary convoluted and difficult and complex experience since colonisation. So my work began around talking to my elders and beginning to understand we need to do something different. And I worked and developed a framework that came from my elders passing knowledge on to me. So Nyatana Luida, uh, the dynamic wisdom of the Yarnik Circle came out of that. And that has given me a space to have build people and take people through a transformative process um, and to like, um, Alison develops uh, our own story, our own narrative. And out of that came work and cultural practice around milestone, mark making and milestone work to help families identify the milestones in their life as a family, as a couple, as a, a mum, as a dad, um, as an individual, um, as an elder. What are those milestones in our life that have shaped our lives? So we start to recognize and talk about that and we create our own symbols and, and our own story about that and, and push back against the predominant culture's narrative about who we are and what we are and what we're allowed to experience and, and tell of ourselves. Then with that came the work that I began to do around the Big Sister program um, which is around 38 years ago in central Queensland, which was about supporting young mothers who themselves had been in the foster care system, in the out of home system, and had found themselves having babies and being in situations where they couldn't necessarily control um, the impact of what was happening in conflictual relationships and their children were being removed. So that cycle was being repeated. And then out of that, growing older and becoming a grandmother, I engaged with my colleagues around the um, grandmother law process, where we are connecting um, grandmothers across the country um, to build this understanding that we have the rights to express our cultural law around the way we raise and support family and build community around family because we were recognising the fact that more and more of our children were being removed. And what was horrifying beyond anything else was the removal of these children, the planned removal um, of babies before they were even born, and then the removal of those babies as, uh, as soon as they were born or very soon after. So in that, in that place, I've been working to build supports um, at, with my colleagues and people like Fe, um, Colleen Wall, who raised and carried this concept of grandmother law and put it on the agenda with the Family Law Council as the Indigenous representative on the Family Law Council. Aside and connected to that was the work we've done around kin carers systems, which is an informal care that grandmothers older sisters, uncles, brothers give to other members of their family, um, children of other members of their family to keep them with family and to keep them safe and to provide for them. And uh, we had great support from a whole range of people, including um, Judge, her honoured Judge Josephine Willis, who's a member of the Federal Circuit Court and has seen this as a very important piece of work. So there's been a whole lot of other people who've inspired and supported that, like um, uh, Mary Graham, Auntie Mary Graham, Auntie Lilla Watson, who supported and inspired me, and they're behind this as well. What we're concerned about is the women and the, and the father, the parents of these babies. We're concerned about the way that their bodies are impacted, their mental health and their physiological state at the time of these removals. Um, and leading up to the removals. 
So their conscious, is, if particularly they've had children removed before, just as these previous speakers have, have recognised, these are critical issues. And their mental health is so, um, it is so impacted. The trauma of thinking that this might happen, let alone having it happen, is beyond words for these families, for these young parents and their extended families. Quite often they've spoken to and talked to and engaged with elders. If their own elders are not available or are, are no longer here, um, they, they have gone to the extent of speaking and reaching out to other elders, people like myself and some of those people I've spoken to. They've gone to the extent of trying to find the right people who can support them and build a community of care around them. And then yet still they're under threat. And this is the greatest struggle that we're seeing is still their babies are removed. Sorry, I'm getting a bit emotional. So we believe that we've got standards and we've got frameworks within First Nations communities. We know how to keep our children safe. We know how to support these families with a community of care. We can, if we're supported and there's an investment in it, we can talk and build the grandmother law network nationally. We can build it at the local level and the state level and the, you know, the national level. We can support these families no matter where they are. If they fled to another state for fear of their children being removed, um, or if they've had to move because they've been in a high conflict relationship, we can connect with each other and still create a community of support around those children, um, around those families. What we're seeing is um, that high um, risk of these families being further traumatised and their mental health de decreasing, deteriorating. We're seeing it not only impacting the parents, the biological mother and father, um, even if that father's not around and he still wants to have that connection, he's impacted. We can see how it impacts the whole extended family, her sisters, his sisters, the baby's potential um, other mothers and other fathers, because in our community, the mother's sisters and the mother's brothers are those children's fathers. The father's sisters and the father's brothers are those children's parents. So that's not being recognised to the extent it can. What I want to acknowledge is there's been some tremendous work done here in Queensland and, the, and a legislation has come forward through 35 years of work by the Torres Strait Islander community and my colleague Makrozilu was part of carrying that and my grandchildren's great-grandfather was part of carrying that essential piece of work that recognises the rights of First Nations peoples around the care and the, um, the rearing, the child rearing practices of Torres Strait Islander people. So I believe that's a sign and that's a signal for us to look in there as a signpost. What we're concerned about is the impact of these families being forced to leave their homes to go from one town to another where they've relocated themselves to create a new life. These are just examples I'm giving. And then they're unable to maintain that home because they're required to go back to someplace else where they have to have meetings with child protection and specialist meetings and training with other services that aren't available in their remote or regional locale. I, I honestly believe these are, these are things that are impacting families. And when they leave those homes, those homes are no longer available to them to, to return to. And then they're overcrowded and they're living in overcrowded situations where their other family relatives or friends and oftentimes other elders from another community are trying to support them because they've been asked to do that by elders in another community that belong to these families. So this is where it's impacting not just the life of the couple, the family, the biological parents and the unborn child, it's got that ripple out effect to all of these people who are there waiting as we traditionally did to receive this precious little person. So these are critical things. That trauma goes from being, um, you know, an incident that's impacted 
just the biological mother and that baby at birth and the potential the biological father but all of those other people who offered the support and it becomes a, a, a very complex grief response it becomes a complex trauma response and then I would term it and this is a term that I've introduced into the conversation around trauma and transgenerational trauma is compact trauma because they haven't even gotten over that trauma of the loss and grief and they're already dealing with the loss and grief around other children that have been removed according to that um, that particular legislation that then has given the department rights to go in and remove that newborn child or the unborn child so these are things that we are very concerned about and that it is so um, heartwarming to me to see that this review has taken place and that it is now documented and it's now being made available to people to have an awareness that we need to push for these things and we need to lobby and advocate for that change for these people. I'm just checking, am I up with my 10 minutes yet? <laughs> okay. And so then we go into um, having spoken about the the grief and loss and the trauma impact on the biological mother, um, the baby itself, we, we need to understand what's happened in that place. And I really am thankful and grateful that people are already talking all over the, the country about how we support those parents after that traumatic event of the removal of the child and how we support the whole family system after that traumatic removal of the child, even the threat of the removal of the child. So I'm, I'm really honouring the work that's saying we need interventions much earlier in the process. We need supports and a community of support, cultural community support around that family, that we need to have elders and grandmother law recognised in this space that we need to have an understanding that we have more culturally competent and culturally fit people working in the department, working in child protection, working in the hospitals, working in the midwifery area, working in the senior nursing superintendent area, working in the community where these decisions are uh, played out, whoever is involved in informing about these families, they need to be part of that conversation and they need to be skilled up and become culturally fit to work with our people. One of the other things that we're really concerned about is um, also the, the fact that um, homelessness impacts these families, that insecurity of where these families are going to live is, is such a big issue. And that becomes a, a predominant issue if these families are about to birth and they're living in insecure environments, how do we better support them? What can be said to the government about better housing uh, for these families? Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the people who have the least access to housing, to secure, stable, safe, homes and neighbourhoods and we need to do more about that. Another thing is about supporting the family and in their broader network if they have children and they've been impacted by a removal of a baby or they're impacted by the threat of a removal of an unborn child, how we support their siblings how do we speak to those children and their school teachers and their kindy teachers about what ha what's happening, especially when those people have seen mum come there in her pregnant state, when they've seen her drop her other children off, when they've evidenced, you know, the, that she is carrying a child. How do, we, how do we have those conversations with those other people in that person's network? How do we make it easier for those families who are going through that trauma. So the, 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 I could go on for ages, but I'm saying we have got First Nations frameworks. We have got First Nations understanding of child rearing practices, which include an extended 
family support system, which needs to be honoured and needs to be resourced effectively. I want to see more support for anyone working in the system, whether it's the police, whether it's child protection, whether it's the nursing, given opportunities regularly throughout their career and not just one off and tick the box to say, oh, yes, I went and did a workshop on Aboriginal cultural awareness or Torres Strait cultural awareness. I want to see an investment in that system in ensuring that they are culturally fit to make those decisions and to work with our people. And I want to see workforce strategies that are there to include and support and, and, and have equity in the employment of First Nations peoples in this business. I want to see more support for the and funding for research in this space. These are the things that would support us. And the kind of research that we talk about is this, this community driven research. So an indigenous research agenda that drives this process and underpins this process and brings any of this knowledge that's accrued as a result of that research back to the families that were impacted by this and, and will be impacted by the outcomes of the research and any recommendations. That's me. Um, I, I feel that there are other things that I could share, but I just feel they were the main points of talking about the impact of trauma, not only on the biological parents, and, but also on their siblings and their extended support systems, which um, the previous speakers um, basically raised as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. I always love listening to you speak and hearing you share your wisdom. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to move on to our final speaker, Associate Professor Kath Chamberlain. Kath Chamberlain is a Truraway woman from Tasmania a National Health and Medical Research Council Career Development Fellow and Associate Professor at La Trobe University. Kath is a registered midwife and has over 25 years experience in program and hospital service management, policy implementation, guideline development, evidence-based practice and research. She currently leads a large multi-jurisdictional NHMRC, the Lowitcher Institute funded community-based participatory action research project entitled Healing the Past by Nurturing the Future, which aims to co-design perinatal awareness, recognition, assessment, and support strategies for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander parents experiencing complex childhood trauma. Kath is also a Chief Investigator on an NHMRC Research uh, Centre for Research Excellence uh, to redesign maternal, newborn, and child health services and an NHMRC partnership project to implement caseload midwifery for Indigenous women in Victoria. Thank you, Kath. I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks so much, Jacinta, and to all the other presenters. It's been fantastic to listen to everyone today. I want to start by acknowledging that I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people here in Nam. Um, it's been my real privilege to lead the Healing the Past by Nurturing the Future project. Um, and I'd like to just pay, also pay my respects to elders and acknowledge how hard the discussion that we're having today is. I think, you know, if, if you are feeling a bit distressed listening to some of these stories and this stuff, like that is a natural reaction to, I think, what, you know, what we're all hearing. And, um, you know, just credit, I really want to pay credit to you all for coming here and um, staying with us through this. And as... Um, Alison and Carly Atkinson often advise when we are listening to stuff that can be distressing, you, know, you can do some things to help, which include, they often suggest you know, trying to uh, think about three things that you can see, maybe two things that you can hear and one thing that you can feel and just try to ground yourself a little bit, but really want to acknowledge um, that this is really, really painful and upsetting for all of us. So in the work in the Healing the Past project, I've really intentionally tried to keep the child protection sector at arm's length from us because these issues, you know, that the previous, because of all the issues that the previous speakers have highlighted, to me, it's like this rip that I have on this photo. I mean, one of the photos is my beautiful country that I'm from, the Bay of Fires in Tasmania. The other photo is of a treacherous rip. 
Um, and that is how I think of child protection services. It's this seemingly calm patch of water that looks okay on the surface. It's, people say it's a way of getting support for parents, but we all know when we know that treacherous water and what that looks like, that we would all be sucked out to sea with that agenda, which we know is warped. And as Alison said, the stories are just not our stories. It's a very dominating one. And, you know, as we see with all our parents that are referred to child protection services, they can be sucked. It's this feeling that parents are sucked out to sea. And I've had psychiatrists describe that to me as this sense that parents that they've been supporting have been sucked out to sea at, on this agenda when they've seemingly thought that it was going to be okay to make a referral to get some practical support. So I've really tried to avoid contact, you know, and avoid really interacting with this whole sector through the Healing the Past by Nurturing the Future project, because I felt we really have needed to learn how to swim strongly first and get our own stories right before we even engage with what is going on here. But it's been the absolute elephant in the room for the four years of our co-design project has been this fear of child protection services and the harm and the trauma that is caused to families through that service. So it really is a pleasure today to be part of this Snake Family Matters National Week of Action and to share some of the concerns and the ways that we can think that we, we think that we've heard from communities that we can ensure that our perinatal care services and the support the type of support that we provide for parents is safe and it's high quality and it's proper therapeutic support that is actually helping not harming families. I'll just work out how to change slides, just bear with me. Whoop. All right. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I was just going to um, outline three main things today, go over some of the key concerns that I know have been outlined. Um, also uh, talk through some of the possible actions that we've heard about under each of the child placement principles and then encourage all of you to get on board with the Family Matters campaign because we all need to really be working together with this. So our position is that too many families have been disrupted by the child protection system and the numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander infants being removed from their families, particularly within the first 30 days of life is too high and it's unacceptable. We think we can do better to address the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander parents during pregnancy and following birth to avoid distress and harm and actually support recovery and healing. We must do better and we really have to all work together to support coordinated action um, to foster urgent improvements to this support because it's something that's gonna require, it's, it's the problem's been happening for a long time. It's all a result of intergenerational trauma and it's going to take a whole of community response to um, address it. So I don't want to go over too much of what people have said, but we just, you know, the, the family is culture report, the family matters report, all of those things I think um, really resonate with my colleagues working on the Healing the Past project. Um, and the main concerns being, and, and also other people that are, we've got over 500 stakeholders that, uh, that we collaborate with. And there's been lots of different stories that we've, that we've heard that resonate with those reports. So the main concerns, just to summarize them, is this increasing number of infants being removed shortly after birth. I mean, they we're supposed to be trying to actually close the gap by 45% in 2031, if we go on current trends, we're widening it at the moment, not closing it. In 2018 to 2019, you know, 44 out of every thousand children ad admitted to, um, Aboriginal children were, were, were admitted into out of home care at a rate of 44 out of every thousand. It's nine times the rate of non-Indigenous children. And we know that the outcomes for children being admitted into out of home care are catastrophic. A longitudinal study um, over the, about five years ago or a bit more showed nearly 50% of those, children, those people had attempted suicide within four years of leave, leaving out of home care. You know, this is an absolute national crisis, which potentially contravenes the United Nations Convention on the Right of the Child 
And reducing this overrepresentation starts with reducing this prenatal notifications. And you know, it's really critical to closing the gap. There's many drivers that people have talked about for the increasing number of notifications. I mean, people talk about ostensibly being um, an aim of it being to improve support for parents at an opportune time. And we would agree with that. We just think there's better ways to provide support. Unfortunately, what we're seeing too often is they're seeing increased surveillance and punitive coercive approaches and completely inadequate therapeutic and practical support provided. The guidelines that recommend notifications, guidelines recommending notifications can be made for homelessness, previous involvement with child protection services, mental health, and all those things that Althea mentioned. These are being conceptualised, these are needs that parents have that are being conceptualised as risk and that the fact that they include structural factors such as poverty, poverty and homelessness is clearly discriminatory. And these are practical, we, can easily, we know how to fix, we, there, are, there are resource issues that can be easily fixed, that is not about a risk to the child. So there's also the lack of transparency and the evaluation. And we believe that it's highly possible without this, we actually don't know whether the benefits outweigh the harms and it's probably not, but with, that, with the lack of transparency at the moment, we just have no way of knowing. The one example um, of, of possible harms that Marcia Langton, Professor Marcia Langton has raised in her report is, you know, there's good reasons for wanting to provide support for mothers experiencing violence, but the fear of the Child Protection Service referral is potentially counterproductive and harmful. It offers another potential weapon for coercive partners to use to have the mother's baby removed. It's likely to actually decrease disclosure of violence and the parent actually accessing the support. And some people even avoid antenatal care because of the fear of child protection services. And then on top of that, we need to consider the impact that people have talked about today of using the coercive force of the entire system of justice on parents who have experienced past hurt and current violence at this highly vulnerable time to forcibly remove a baby. This is very similar to the original cause of trauma that is people are experiencing, which is the cause of the problems that people are having. You know, the World Health Organization described complex post-traumatic stress disorder as a cluster of distress symptoms that are caused by repeated traumatic events from which one cannot escape. So we're now using the force of the system to compound. And I really like, Annie, Deb, your, your definition of compacted trauma, because it is this most cruel and inhumane system that is um, you know, just so potentially harmful. We believe the current practice does not reflect the intent of the child placement principles. We, the fact that we even have instances where babies can be removed without the parents being told that this is going to happen. I mean, what planet are we actually on that that happens? I'm having, it really brings reminiscence of the Stanford prison experiment about what is happening here in this system, that something like that can happen that is so um, bizarre to people outside of the system. So the other, the, the, another concern is that despite the opportunity to provide practical living for support, or even when we do, such as in the instance of parents that are in the prison system where they have the opportunity to have full-time live-in support, we're not taking up those opportunities. And all of this poses a moral risk of moral injury for Aboriginal and other healthcare staff that are involved in this system. And, you know, that's one of the real, these are all parts of the drivers of you know, why we're here speaking up today and wanting to be part of this really, really important campaign. So now for the call for change. So first to state very clearly that all of us really agree that the safety, love and nurturing of the children is absolutely central. None of us want to argue about that. We do not dispute it. What we are arguing about is how is what is the best way to be achieving this. The pregnancy and birth is an absolute critical time for healing. It's the best time in the possible life course. It's almost like a natural stress test for trauma. We know there's an increased risk of triggers because of the physiological changes in 
pregnancy, the stresses that can happen with homelessness or financial insecurity, violence. And we also know that a lot of the stuff that can happen during pregnancy and birth care is also potentially triggering because it's quite intimate, a lot of that experience. So it's actually natural for parents who have experienced some sort of trauma in the past to have a sort of exacerbation and have that as an intense time. What we need to be doing is working with that, not making it worse. And so despite all those risks, we know from the longitudinal studies of youth in detention in America, as well as the qualitative studies that this is absolutely the best time for healing. More people recover from trauma at this time than any other time during their life course. And this is gonna be central to closing the gap and a lot of other health issues. And the other important thing is it's actually the first point of contact with the health services since childhood for most people, because these are healthy young adults. And we need to be doing this a lot better. So we know clearly that from the evidence as well, it's not just an important time for the child's development, although it's absolutely essential. It's also a critical time for brain development for the parents with um, you know, a lot of physiological changes going on and the nurturing and love that the, that the children bring into the world with them is the healing salve for that trauma. One of the most tragic aspects of the colonial war that we're all witnessing here on Aboriginal people has been the direct attack on Aboriginal families. And as maternity care workers, you know, I really see it that we're on the front line of this war. And many of the families that we're talking about today are the worst affected casualties. And the important thing that we need to be trying to do is offer a sanctuary and a sense of safety so that people can recover. And then the nurturing love, the babies bring that into the world with them. And our role is to be supporting that and nurturing that. So instead, we're seeing too many families um, re-victimised by the system. And, you know, there's, I know there's a lot of good people in that system, but the system is the problem. We have got a whole healthcare system designed to ensure that we can meet so many complex physical health needs. We can care for babies now with great success that are born weighing less than a pound of butter. We can develop a COVID vaccine in 12 months. Yet when somebody comes in with, to the healthcare system with complex social and emotional needs, it's somehow too hard. And we have to refer that out to the child protection system, which I don't believe has the seriously, um, you know, the degree of expertise and specialist um, support that is needed to provide it for, parent, for our most vulnerable families. Um, so the other points that we've put here is that we must commit to courageously truth-telling and that's within our communities as well. And the Family um, Matters Building Blocks and Child Placement Principles provide a really good framework for action for moving forward. We have to provide better feasible alternatives to removing children at birth. So just under the way forward here, we've put a few su suggestions, but Really today is the start of a conversation. We're not even proposing to come up with the answers, but these are some of the things that people have suggested communities have um, talked about. So first of all, under prevention, we really need to ensure that all parents have access to culturally safe, experienced preventive support during pregnancy, birth and early postpartum care. So this includes proper continuity of carer programs, and we have some fabulous examples like the Birthing in Our Community program led by Yvette Bro and Sue Kilday up in Queensland, where they've demonstrated 50% reductions in preterm births, as well as other lots of incredible outcomes. The Bagarook project here in Victoria. We need resources to help parents understand what is happening, that they're actually the responses that they're having are natural responses to difficult situations. And these include cultural ways of fostering social and emotional wellbeing. We need practical strategies to help and culturally safe services. Um, we need to be working with families holistically to ensure that informal family supports can be nurtured and strengthened. And it's safety that is really the critical thing here. What we're trying to do is 
you know, minimise the, the fight, flight and fight response that is the natural response that we would actually be expecting. And we need to ensure that all providers in, involved in care have the appropriate knowledge, attitudes and practice skills to provide the high level of expertise when it's needed. We need the partnerships are absolutely critical. I mean, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are the absolute experts in relational healing and connectedness. It's central to our wellbeing, and we need to honour this wisdom and expertise and really enable communities to be able to lead this. In, with regards to placement, we need to ensure that all parents who are required as, you know, identified as actually requiring more intensive report, support receive really good high quality evidence-based support. And this includes things like access to high quality childcare services, like the amazing um, Bubba program, the um, Bubba Willem program in Victoria led by Lisa Thorpe and others. We um, need to make sure that those risk factors like homelessness and poverty are actually addressed first. And one of the things that we've talked about is having some kind of wise council model, which involves a combination of professional and cultural expertise, if there is like a lot of complexity, to really make sure that there's a that parents are getting the best support they need, and that every that the decisions that are made are transparent, and people are feeling comfortable, and that there's consensus that given all of the challenges that this family is facing, this is the best possible decision to make at this point in time, and to revisit that in a way that is wise and considering all those things. There's also some fantastic examples in, um, or one fantastic example in New Zealand of quality live-in accommodation, which um, Jill Faulkner went on a visit there and described it as, um, you know, very, uh, what was the word? Uh, a dignified accommodation where people could live with dignity and, and essentially the message was, you know, we're going to love you until you're able to love you, your, your baby and yourself and to provide that beautiful, warm, nurturing support in a way that is truly nurturing and caring and not judgmental and punitive. And all of this will take resources, but given the amount of resources that are poured into the outer home care system and the catastrophic consequences and costs of this continued failure, it's going to save money in the long run. We know that it will and we, um, you know, we just need to do that evaluation to show how much money this saves, not how much it costs. Finally, the participation is vital. You know, we need to have transparent, open discussions. There's no excuse for a baby, parents not even knowing that their baby's going to be removed. Um, as Deborah said, that is that just terrifies everybody in the community. Um, it's it's hard to imagine how that could even even happen. And finally, under connection, you know, if um, that but ensuring that ongoing connection is really really critical. Um, make it, there's lots of ways that we can do that to promote that ongoing bonding, and with photos. We can support parents to express breast milk. We can do all of those kind of things to actually help parents to have that um, bond with their baby, even if they can't be with them physically at that time. So I'll just um, finish up uh, with the last couple of slides. So in conclusion, uh, the current situation, you know, it is unacceptable. I'm an epidemiologist and clear, very, very clear that we are not going to be able to close any of those goals or targets on any on any of those other gaps until we get this one right, including around reducing incarceration, improving the health and wellbeing, are absolutely dependent on this one. Um, you know, anything that we can invest in effective approaches, I really think is going to be showing how much we save both socially and financially. And we've shown during COVID-19 that our communities can lead these programs really effectively and more effectively than um, non-Indigenous communities. You know, we recognise, and I certainly recognise that these issues are really, really hard. I'm not coming in here today saying, oh, this is really easy to fix. This is the hardest thing 
that we as healthcare providers and communities working together need to do. It's way harder than, you know, surgery or any of those kind of things. But I think, you know, we have the capacity to be able to do it. We just need to really get together and start doing this a lot better and treating it as seriously as we should, you know, as we need to. And the time for the coordinated action is now. It's really critical we do this carefully, properly, transparently, and with the proper research and evaluation. So I just really encourage you all to join the Family Matters campaign. I'm really delighted to be here and to be part of it. And I've just put um, some contact details there too if people want to um, get in touch. I'll actually go back to the one with the Family Matters. Thank you, Jacinta, and I'll mute myself now <laughs> and to everyone. Thank you so much, Kath. Um, acknowledge how difficult it is for everyone here to sit and listen um, you know, to these research and practice stories as we see so many of these present continuities with the past and with the stolen generations. Um, in the chat box, we do have some phone numbers and services for people to reach out to if you're feeling like you need more support. Um, it's a very, very difficult topic. Um, and, you know, it, it really does affect the lives of whole communities. We um, have around half an hour um, for some questions from the audience. So feel free to pop your questions in the chat box and I'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members of the audience, um, please indicate uh, your Aboriginality and Islander status um, and make sure, I'll make sure that we prioritise your questions in the order. Um, one of the first questions we've had come through, and I might uh, start off with you, Alison. Um, what do you see in your work as a constraint for parents to the reunification process? Thanks, Jacinta. Um, I guess just bouncing off what Megan Davis had written, there's a downturn in functioning post-removal in parents. Um, Without fail, every one of the women that I think of and their families, the very response, which is a very normal traumatised response of increasing risk-taking substance use, um, driving fast, all those kind of things, is a very normal response to something that's absolutely, like we're saying, not acceptable. And yet it's the very constraint that they're expected to minimise all this risk-taking in order to work towards reunification. So the lens of trauma recovery is not in those questioning around the department. That's the way I see it. It's not. It's simply set up to say you have to get your substance use and your mental health assessments and everything else in order to sort of have this good, safe space for the baby if they don't have housing, there's often constraints there and exactly what Deb was saying, that secure base. If they don't have housing, most of the women coming out of prison are saying, I can't get my child back because I'm not going to have a house and the department will not even consider it. So those sort of first steps of working with the story of knowing from the trauma lens that you need the secure base and you are going to have a reaction to this instead of expecting them to not react, get it together, and then sort of it, it's that narrative again around not seeing that these are trauma responses and the minute that you do it, no one would act any differently. Um, so I guess, yeah, for me that, that, that phrase that Megan wrote, I was like, no one's seeing that. There's going to be a downturn. The minute we're going to expect a big reaction in this family and it's totally understandable so let's not remove and do the opposite like Kath was saying with some of the programs even the detox clinics the living with mum in prison some of these programs they're in a clearer space away from all the stress of what's triggering a lot of the uh, and to even understand why why am I like this where's this started from it didn't start with me you know all of those stories around colonization and how trauma behaviors sort of keep compounding until we become that 
So I guess I don't know whether that answered it, but it was kind of like that's the constraint that I'm seeing. It's not so much the pre-unborn notifications or the post-removal. It's not seeing it through that trauma lens. And we just need that in every system, in the legal system, in the education system, in the healthcare systems, um, and hopefully through some of these, like the Healing the Past and the great programs, Deb's program, that this lens can come in, that these culturally informed trauma practices of recovery is what will remove that constraint. So even if they're at high risk at the time of birth, the, the reunification will be fast because then the, that placement of what's missing there's a big trauma response going on thanks that's me over to everybody else <laughs> thank you Alison um Kath Althea Emma um Deb did you want to add anything to that question around constraints for parents to the reunification process I think what I've also heard is the resourcing issue and the um, importance of all of the different systems working together. Um, and that kind of leads into one of the other questions that we have here. And that's around what can those of us um, who are outside of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and outside of the health system do to help? I might put you on the spot, Deb, if you want to tackle that question. Um, I, I think um, people need to be informed to start with and become culturally informed. So they need to understand if they're non-Indigenous people um, working in any of those structures or systems, they need um, to get right with our people's culture and our cultural ways of knowing, being and doing. That's what our elders have been saying forever and that's what we'll continue to say even within our own communities who've been um, forcibly distanced over time um, or even rapidly from our cultural understandings and our ways of doing business. Sorry, that's my little dog barking. I put him outside. Um, and um, if, if we can um, build that cultural competency to get people culturally fit, that's a critical part of it. And that piece of work around cultural humility because we've got these people um, working with our families in in and coming in from outside with no understanding of our culture our ways of knowing and being doing our ways of doing family um, it may not look the same as their ways but this is our way and they can't look at us through that lens um, using a trauma-informed, culturally-informed lens with cultural humility would be a great start. Um, and then resourcing those systems that are there, that are homegrown, where people are reaching out and using them, um, like the, many of those things that have been named today, they that would be, you know, a great start. Making sure they get a good start. I'm just reminded of the budget, and this is a little political, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to any government in place because they come and they go. It's whimsical. But, you know, the budget that was brought down recently, I could not see how it addressed our community. It addressed the upper end of town. It, ad it addressed the professional working mums, you know, um, when it, it talked about those kinds of things that it was going to do to support women and support families. And, you know, it just makes a whole lot of assumptions that our people have, are employed and have got a house and have got a car and, you know, have got all these kinds of resources which they don't, you know, we've got young families that, that are doing it really tough and they aren't resourced to that level. And so a lot of cultural assumptions are made by non-Indigenous people in influential decision-making positions. And I think we've got to start to work with those people. So reports um, and research like this are powerful, powerful tools for us to go in and have those conversations with people. 
they are my immediately res um, immediate responses because I, I don't think I could have said more or better than those responses that Alison had. Thank you, Deb. Um, one of the other questions we've had come through is how do the different states and territories contrast with each other in managing unborn notifications, providing early intervention and providing post removal support? Not sure who would like to have a go at that, um, Kath, Althea or Emma, if you have experience across the diverse states and territories. I'm just looking at you, Jacinta, thinking you might be the expert because you've been, Snake have been involved doing that um, review of all the different state and territories. Uh, and I just wanted to say for the other, the other just to build on Deborah's thing, also to join the Family Matters campaign to help because, you know, we're all trying to get um, behind you and support you in the amazing work that you're doing at Snake. But, yeah, I'm not... Uh, all I know about it is the, not all I know, but the that re report that that Snake have been doing, I think, is really comprehensive at the moment. That talks about the differences. Um, Jacinta, did you want to talk about that? Sorry to throw it back at you. <laughs> <Or not. laughs> well, I guess in response to that question, is there's no national approach to managing these unborn no notifications, and there is a lot of variability across all of the different states and territories. And a lot of that is guided by individual state and territory legislation and the amount of resourcing that those different states and territories put into early intervention, prevention, health, um, childcare, uh, whether or not the Commonwealth is responsible for some of that funding as well can have an impact. Um, but I think also, as Deb was saying, we do definitely have that uh, tendency to judge parenting by Western standards. Um, and so there's also that variability at the individual practitioner level um, and with maternity um, services and midwives and nurses um, having those expectations around parenting um, and what, you know, uh, good parenting looks like, what good antenatal health care looks like. So a lot of those judgments come into play as well. Um, we are wondering, um, there is a question um, in the, that I received outside of the chat box, but how can we actually prevent uh, these removals in the first instance? And what can we critically do to ensure that um, Aboriginal and Islander children are able to stay with their families in the first instance? Althea, did you wanna share some of the insights from the Family is Culture Review? I think you might be on mute, Althea. Um, I can kick off with talking about this a little bit. Um, so one of the things that we identified as a persistent issue with the cases was that women would either reach out to the department for help when they knew they were pregnant or would be notified to the department very early in their pregnancy, but the department would issue a high-risk birth alert and close the file. And it was the perspective in the review that if that opportunity to work with the mother had been used effectively, those children wouldn't have been removed. Um, and that was, I think, particularly acute when you could see that mothers were asking for help and the department was literally doing nothing um, in response to those requests um, and then proceeding to remove the child. Um, was there any other examples or, or issues you'd like to talk about, Althea? Um, no, I just... Honestly, the earlier the intervention, the better. Um, I think the problem we saw in a lot of our case files is that uh, there, there is evidence that Aboriginal mothers um, often present later to hospital for prenatal um, care, and that can lead to late notifications to the department as well and um, limited time to work um, with the family. So I just think the earlier families can be, expectant parents can be supported um, and kind of just, uh, you know, get their, get their ducks in a row. So, you know, just really prove that they can you know care for their unborn baby and it's 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 a real onus to put on parents to have to kind of generate that evidence themselves but 
um, given just the high rates of notifications and removals, I think it's just essential to, to just do everything you can at the earliest possibility. Um, and so then the there is, you have evidence to show the department when your child is born, what, what you've done and, and, you know, how safe your baby's going to be. Um, because until, uh, I guess the problem we saw, and there was a question in the chat about shouldn't, shouldn't the department have to prove that they have done something to work with um, expectant parents? Well, they actually, you know, don't, they, there's a big framework of guidelines and policies and legislation. And I guess our review found that um, often that's just completely ignored and not complied with. Um, and there's very limited accountability um, with the department um, for the casework. And so, as everyone's been saying, this type of research and discussions, they're just so important to kind of throw light on the issue and, and show what's happening in practice. Um, and yeah, so um, I guess, yeah. I guess my point is, if the department doesn't provide the assistance, it's just so important that families can find it somewhere at the earliest possible stage. Yeah, I'd, I'd add on to that. Absolutely. I mean, I'd, I'd really just think that we should be doing a lot more of this, providing proper culturally safe support outside and not referring, unless there's actually a risk to the child. We know that... Um, the, that you know, there's some great examples of really good nurturing care programs. We, we need to have better evaluation of them, implementation and systematic evaluation. So, I mean, I'm going to get into trouble because there's so many and I can't list them all, but, um, you know, thinking of the amazing Madaz program up there where they've provided really good support, like I mentioned, the birthing in our community. And it's a lot of it is the outcomes... Uh, you know, there's been no notification since they implement those programs, but the numbers are so small that it kind of hasn't really translated into um, research as such. But I think, you know, we, we need more of that and community controlled and led, and we do know how to nurture and support our families as Ani Dev has described. And it's, it's love and care that is the answer, not a punitive, what we expect you know, send, referring them onto the justice system when people were emotional, needing love and care. So we need to have a lot more of that, and I think we can do it. Um, I mean, it's not to say we're a bunch of softies. We are, you know, we have to, we, we really can do this a lot better. If I, I, if, that <laughs> if I could just say, you know, it, it, the last comment Catherine made is critical that we know how to do love we can we can do strong love you know we can have the hard yarns with our mob we're not afraid to do that um, we just need to effectively resource those people um, to have to build this their networks to have supports we need to effectively resource the supports that do work and so we need to have that evaluation around all of those things that are working and we need to support a, a national network that captures all of those different practices and groups and of uh, and clusters of support, so that we can, um, I guess, have a coordinated understanding and a coordinated vision around how we take this thing forward. This is about us taking control and about us being self-determining as First Nations people and not being reactive because currently that's all we're doing. Uh, we're, we're forced to be reactive and that's not about us. That's not our agenda. We've made it very clear what our agenda is and we know very well how to live healthy lives and rear children successfully. We've been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. We just need to be able to support our families and resource them effectively. We don't have enough supports for men when there's domestic and family violence um, to take them out of the picture rather than remove the mother and the children. You know, men would like that. Men would need that. Men need to be supported how to be dads and fathers. Most of them haven't had an opportunity to be properly parented themselves. We need supports for grandmothers um, and, and sisters 
to help those ones that have just had the baby or about to have babies and all the way through the pregnancy walk with them. These are some practical things, but they're things that just don't seem to hit the light. Can I just add to, I think one of the themes that's coming up in the chat as well is um, the department as the last resort, like really utilise a lot of the community orgs, the NGOs, and I know like I, with the child protection, um, quite often because they're, they're in their own parallel trauma response, like you're saying, reacting, they don't want to share the load, so they don't trust they just want to have the whole story and manage it instead of going, actually, I'm not in the best place, especially if it's not a culturally informed um, practice. Like Madas is a great example. So he's do some work up there of putting the it back but supporting so it doesn't fail. Because if you're suddenly having to take on some of the role that child protection was doing, um, you can also feel like, you almost join them in going, oh, I'm not doing any better uh, sort of job. The babies are still being removed. But really bring it back to the community orgs and saying who's out there, what's working, let's do more of that and, and connect the families because it is really isolating to not know who the services are around that are going to support who can I actually trust, especially when you've had gone to different ones and asked for help, like you said, Althea, and then the department's done nothing like then you'll be looking at all services in that light going no one's there for me so I guess yeah just taking that as the last resort and the department then in those few cases where it is really genuinely high risk can do a better job at that end and leave all the ones that we can actually wrap around and keep that baby with mum and dad and families that, that reminds me, Alison, of what you're, you know, we've been talking a little bit um, based on all that feedback about having good sort of basic training for perinatal care providers to understand trauma. I've been talking with Alison about having mentoring because this is really, really complicated stuff that, we, uh, that workers are having to deal with. Uh, so how do we support workers to be properly trained as well as have that ongoing mentoring to deal with this kind of complexity that there's not you're not going to be able to learn this out of a textbook this yeah. is the kind of thing that you need proper experienced people supporting you as you're learning to be able to work with this and also the other thing we've been talking about is rather than like refer out to child protection systems if there is people parents experiencing that complexity maybe if, if child protection services are needed bringing them in with us to work together and talking about, we've been sort of throwing this idea around about a wise council model, which includes community expertise and um, professional expertise and that show community led. But really it's that working through the complexity and trying to get, you know, there's gonna be a lot of judgment here. This is gonna require wisdom and it's gonna require, it's, it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be making the best decision and people, the group, the wise council, what we're proposing would need to be feeling comfortable that that was the best decision made at the time and that it's transparent and that we have a system of learning of how to deal with this, to how to support parents better um, so that we can continually learn in this space. Because the problem is we don't, you know, we, we just don't have the system even set up to be learning how to do this better. Thank you so much for those insights. And I just want to plug in here to the Family Matters um, building blocks that we've been calling for change around the importance of prevention and early intervention. You know, a few comments in the chat box spoke about the, the difficulties that statutory services may have in providing early intervention and prevention support. And part of that is linked to the under-resourcing. We know that only 17% of the funding, the nearly $6 billion of funding spent in child protection is on early intervention and prevention. So just want to encourage you all to support the Family Matters campaign and all the hard work that they do. And thanks once again to our speakers, um, Alison Elliott of La Trobe University's Bouverie um, Centre Indigenous team, Deborah Bennett from Relationships Australia Queensland, 
La Trobe University's Associate Professor Catherine Chamberlain, and Emma Buxton Namaznik, and Dr. Elthea Gibson from the Families Culture Review Team. We've benefited greatly from your knowledge and your expertise today. Um, a reminder to everyone here that the recording of this event will be available to share with your colleagues and organisations, and it will be sent around in an email on Monday next week for those of you who've signed up to the Family Matters campaign. The link to sign up to the campaign is in the chat now for those of you who haven't yet joined us. Um, our action for today is a request that when the email is sent around next week, you'll undertake to share it with at least one work colleague, um, or preferably more, um, because we all need to be engaged in ensuring that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies can stay with their families from birth. Um, please remember to visit our Family Matters website and sign up for the campaign if you haven't already done so. Lastly, this is the final event of our Family Matters National Week of Action. Um, and I just wanted to give a shout out to Paul Gray, who is um, one of our co-chairs of the Family Matters um, campaign. Hi, Paul. And Paul's been with us this whole time and listening and taking it all in. So um, on behalf of uh, Sue Ann Hunter and Paul, um, I'd like to thank everyone, every person here who's contributed to the success of this National uh, Week of Action for the Family Matters campaign and to all of those who have attended our week of events and for all of you, all of you who have followed us along on Twitter as well. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank Snake and my colleagues on the Family Matters National Leadership Group, in particular um, Associate Professor Paul Gray um, and my fellow social worker Sue Ann Hunter. Thank you everyone for coming along today. Have a good weekend. Thank you.